Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zurück. Ich finde es erstaunlich, wenn Sie mir die Bemerkung erlauben. Wir hatten für diesen Saal, der 160 Plätze hat, eine Überbuchung ungefähr um 100 Prozent. Und einigen mussten wir leider sagen, also es ist so voll, es wird kein Platz mehr sein. Ich freue mich sehr, dass mein Kollege Ben Scott aus seiner Sicht zu unserem Thema sprechen wird. Ben und ich haben uns kennengelernt beim Beitritt der Bundesregierung, der Bundesrepublik zur Freedom Online Coalition in Tunis. Und nachdem mein Mandat ausgelaufen ist, haben wir uns getroffen, haben überlegt, was tun wir in einer Situation, in der eine Technologie, die wir beide für zukunftsbestimmt und für wesentlich für unsere beiden Länder halten, so unter massivem Beschuss steht. Und was tun wir in einer Situation, in dem auch das transatlantische Verhältnis, was wir auch beide als wesentlich für unsere Länder betrachtet haben, so unter Beschuss ist? Was können wir tun, um zu einer Wiederherstellung von Vertrauen beizutragen? Und das Privacy-Projekt war das Ergebnis dieser Überlegungen. Deswegen freue ich mich sehr, Ben, auf deine Worte hier. So, ich fange an mit einer Entschuldigung. Ich habe gedacht, dass ich doch diesen ganzen Vortrag auf Deutsch machen kann, aber leider geht es doch nicht. Und deswegen wechsle ich zu Englisch, aber ich verspreche, es ist besser so, weil ich sagen kann, weil, was ich sagen will. So, I hope it's not uh, too much of an inconvenience. I promise I'll try to be entertaining. I've been in Germany now for two and a half years. Um, been married to a German for 12 years. And my children now count themselves more German than American. So I have experienced the Snowden affair from the peculiar perspective of an American in Germany. And this has shaped both my critique of my own government and my analysis of what Germany can and should do to solve the problems before us. With this speech, I want to do three things. One is I want to step back and talk about where we stand in the progress of reform post-Snowden. Small hint, not very far. Second, I want to talk about what the core problem is. And third, I want to offer a specific agenda, strategies for strategic interventions in politics that are aimed at the core problem and help us to fix the problem of no progress. So when we look back 18 months after the first Snowden revelations, we can see a variety of things. One, public outrage in Europe created a very serious disruption to transatlantic relations. A heated debate has begun on human rights and civil liberties in a digital age, not just in Brussels and Berlin, but also in Washington. And it triggered calls for rapid changes in law and policy from a movement of citizens from large sectors of industry and from political leaders. And yet, despite the biggest scandal in modern intelligence history, 18 months on, there have been no changes. The heat of the moment be, appears to be fading, and Germany is now among the only countries still publicly challenging the US and the UK to change their ways. And even those challenges are now less frequent. Most countries have now made a quiet accommodation with the NSA. And not a single European country has attempted to modernize its own laws governing surveillance. And now we see even the limited reform bill in Washington that would have protected American privacy rights from the NSA has failed, killed in the United States Senate, short by two votes. No clear prospect for return. 
Why is that? Why have we seen so little progress? I think for two main reasons. One is it's a very difficult problem to solve. And the second is that the political leaders have seen the political consequences of the Snowden affair, and they don't seem so bad. They are manageable, let's face it. And those manageable consequences appear to lead to the conclusion that in the short term, we need to do nothing. So what is the most likely political outcome from the Snowden affair in Germany, in Europe, and in the United States? What is the most likely legal and political change to result from the greatest scandal in intelligence history? The most likely outcome is nothing. Despite everything that you've heard this morning, all the great discussions about what could happen and why it's urgent that it should happen, the most likely thing that we will get as citizens in the post snowden era is a big zero, unless we do something about that, unless we do something about that, because this big zero is hugely frustrating for advocates of human rights and civil liberties. This big zero is demoralizing for public confidence in democratic government. And yet, at the same time, this big zero is not especially surprising given realpolitik. And we have to think about this Snowden problem not in the, in the sense of immediate solutions, but as a long game. We will be talking about human rights and civil liberties in a digital world for a very long time, and it is now our job to keep up the pressure and put forward strategic interventions at each point in the process towards long-term reform. Because there are serious consequences for the big zero, very serious consequences. They are not immediately visible, but these serious consequences will affect every single one of us over time. What is the message that we send to the average citizen when they see that no changes have resulted post Snowden? The message that we send them is that neither technology nor government are trustworthy. And the combination of technology and government should earn either their skepticism or their hostility. What does that distrust look like? How will it change the relationship between people and technology over time? How will it affect the relationship between governments and their peoples? How will we evaluate the value of civil liberties and human rights standards when we ourselves in democratic countries do not uphold them? The full effect of the Snowden Affair on public attitudes towards the internet is still in its early stages, but I think those consequences are going to mount. And yet, we can see in consumer behavior no evidence that that's happening. Why is it that most people have not changed their behavior towards technology despite the fact that they are now aware of a global surveillance machine? Why is it that people still carry their mobile phones despite the fact they know these are blinking, beeping tracking devices? Why is it that people still search the web and shop online and document their lives on social networks? And why is it that only a small fraction of people bother with end-to-end -end encryption technologies even though they've been available for 20 years? As I see it, there are three possible reasons. Reason number one, I don't know about technology. I don't read the newspaper, I haven't paid attention. It's all passed me by. Second reason, I know that I'm being surveilled, but I don't care. In this category come people who have embraced the openness of the internet as a platform of exhibition. In this category come people who are happy to trade security for liberty. And in this category of people come those who say, when I balance the possibility of being surveilled one time in my life by the NSA versus the everyday use of technology, I'm going to take the latter. The third reason is I know what's happening, I care about it, but what can I do? I've given up. 
There was a recent poll done by the Pew Research Internet Project that gives us some insights about how people fall into those categories. And the Pew study, which admittedly was a survey of Americans, the Pew study said 5% of Americans have never heard of the NSA affair. I don't know what cave they live in. <laughs> but 91% agreed that consumers have lost control over how personal information is collected online. And 80% agreed that people should be concerned about how government is monitoring their communications. What that tells me is that the vast majority of people fall into category three. I know my data is being collected and surveilled. I don't like it, but I can't do anything about it. What we're watching is a serious transformation in what you might call the normative understanding of technology. And what is emerging is a normative cynicism. I understand the problem. I'm upset about it. I consider all the solutions futile. I can't take technology out of my life anymore. That's not realistic. And I also don't expect the government to stop surveillance projects that I think are illegitimate. So what can I do? I just go about my business. The consequences of that normative cynicism are quite serious. Think about for a moment what was the normative understanding of technology three years ago during the Arab Spring? Newspapers said Twitter revolution. It was the heyday of cyber utopianism. The internet was the great liberatory technology, a decentralized platform of communication that empowered political movements and lowered barriers to entry to marketplaces of ideas and commerce. Now this vision was flawed and exaggerated and ignored concerns about security that were made at the time. But that normative view was deeply held three years ago. Today, we've seen a decisive shift. Today, the normative view about the internet is that as a technology of social and political control. We have shifted to a Hobbesian view of the internet as a tool of manipulation. And while that dystopian vision is also exaggerated and ignores many of the positive things that technology brings to our lives or overshadows them, that normative cynicism is also deeply held. That is a massive shift to happen so fast. Three years. Attitudes have changed. The impact is not transacted on a daily basis. The impact does not mean I'm going to throw my phone in the trash when I get home tonight. The impact is systemic and changes my behavior over time in ways that we cannot yet measure. But we can hypothesize about what these changes will look like. We can be pretty sure that the failure to address the Snowden problem will result in a loss of faith in democratic government. Or shall I say, more of a loss of faith in democratic government. And that loss of public confidence in democratic legitimacy at home will translate into the loss of moral authority and credibility of democratic governance in the international community. Second hypothesis, people will begin to lose faith, faith in technology. And while I may not give up the tools that I use today because they are too far integrated into my life, I may be more hesitant to adopt tomorrow's tools. And for those people who have not yet experienced the internet revolution, they will be walking through that door with a completely different attitude towards those technologies. That matters. That matters because it changes the dynamics of the internet and digital communications networks as a tool of soft power in the world. The utopian vision of the internet was powerful for a reason. It's because that decentralized network that puts billions of people in contact with information and communications technologies is a powerful social tool of progress and liberation. It is also a powerful tool of control and manipulation. It is a question of law and policy, which one has the upper hand? Because cumulatively, the power of the internet is not the Twitter revolution, it is not the creation of the next Google. The power of the internet is 
three, four, five billion people getting access to information and communications on a daily basis for the small things that they do every day. It's not on the front of the magazine. It's not counted in a GDP statistic. But it changes the world. And that is what we stand to lose with normative cynicism. So that's, that's the bad news. The bad news is that the consequences of doing nothing as a result of the Snowden revelations are deeply, deeply worrying. But the good news is, and, and I was very pleased at, at the discussions this morning, the good news is, is that there is still a strong feeling that there are opportunities for reform, that there are opportunities to change things, and that there are corrective forces in democratic self-government. But we have a window of opportunity to begin making these changes. And it won't last forever, and we need to move now. We can't waste more time. Because no result is an unacceptable result. The normative cynicism that we see descending on the internet community is an unacceptable result. And I believe that most nations, democratic nations, will not only seek to change policy because it's the right thing to do, they will do it because it's in their interest to do it. We heard earlier that Nations don't have allies, nations have interests. I think that's sadly true. But I think protecting an internet based on legitimate rules and standards of human rights and civil liberties is in the interests of most nations. And it is incredibly short-sighted to sacrifice that interest in exchange for business as usual in the shadow world of the intelligence community. Key question here is how will we regulate power on the internet? Whether you're a subscriber to the utopian view or the dystopian view of the internet, what we're really talking about is power through technology. Now, the key to the Snowden debate, the key to the reform movement that will come out of it is about how we handle that power. And when we talk about power on the internet, we're talking about trust. Do I trust that the internet has more to offer me than it does to take from me? But trust at the end of the day is really about legitimacy. Legitimacy is at the core of the Snowden problem. Is the system of government that constrains and oversees the application of power on the internet legitimate? Do I believe it will constrain those things which harm my interests and encourage those things which benefit me? Legitimacy is the key to a successful alignment of political views in Germany for German policy on surveillance. Legitimacy is the key for an alignment of views in Europe. And ultimately, legitimacy is the key to a transatlantic solution. But it's a complicated problem for many reasons. One of the reasons is that, as we, we heard this morning, Americans and Europeans have very different understandings about power. In order to understand the NSA, you have to understand American exceptionalism. There were many Americans who were appalled at the Snowden revelations, who felt that the US government had gone too far. But at the same time, they were also proud. Because the power and capability of American military is deeply ingrained in American nationalism. That contradiction is very difficult to understand in Europe, and even more difficult to understand in Germany, because Germany has its own exceptionalism. German exceptionalism is the mirror image of American exceptionalism. German exceptionalism is about controlling the application of government power, limiting and constraining the application of hard power. And so that is why Germany and the United States are probably on two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to democratic societies debating the relative legitimacy of surveillance policy. And yet this contradiction is not lethal. 
This contradiction is misleading because we are also dependent on one another. Europe is dependent on the hard power that American military and intelligence forces bring. That's a fact. It's an ugly fact, but it's a fact. Look what's happening in the Middle East right now. Europe is supporting the United States spending and military force on the ground in a fight against ISIS. But the United States needs the legitimacy that Europe brings to international affairs and foreign policy. We want that shared legitimacy, and to get that shared legitimacy, we have to have a dialogue about the control and constraints placed on that power. That's relatively easy to see in, in the hard power applications of military forces. But the same thing is true in the application of digital power, and that's what this debate is really about. How do we begin to modernize a common understanding of legitimacy in the application of digital power between democratic states, historic allies? Where does that begin? I think, and, and again, this echoes much of what we've heard today, and what you heard today, I think it's notable to say, is very new. This is the first event that I've been to where the conversation was not about the NSA, but about German law. What, what can we do at the national level? Because this debate begins at the national level. No one has the moral authority to go to their neighbors and ask them to do something that you do not do yourself. Reform will begin here. Then it will go to the European level. And only then can it come to the transatlantic level. And I think these solutions will have to be based on common interests and not on a threat of collapsed relationship or economic exclusion. It's a difficult bridge to get across because for many, the only and most important villain in the Snowden story is the NSA. But the truth is more complicated. Consider what's happened in the Bundestag's inquiry committee. The NSA Untersuchungsausschuss has uncovered very few new facts about the NSA. But it has uncovered a whole lot of new facts about the BND. The Eichenall story that my friend Georg Maskalo broke in the Süddeutsche should have been a bomb in the middle of this debate. And yet somehow it wasn't. We need to go back and pick that up again. The cooperation between the agencies is not an isolated incident. This is a 40-year planned operation. The laws governing surveillance in Germany and in other European states are not that different than the laws governing surveillance in the United States. Yes, the scope and capacity and technological capability and budget that the Americans bring to the table is vastly different, but the law, the legitimacy of these operations it's based on the same ideas. And if we want to change that at the transatlantic level, we're going to have to change it here. That's why I think Germany should embrace its exceptionalism. Embrace the idea that Germany has perhaps the greatest amount of credibility in the world, of any country, when it comes to constraining the power of government. Barack Obama can talk all day about how he's not going to do the things that he could do, and most people won't believe him. German leaders stand up and say that, people believe it. That is powerful. That is a pathway to building legitimacy at the European level. That, that could make Germany the, the Weltmeister of legitimacy when it comes to surveillance policy. But it's going to take time, and we have to think about this as a long game. And if we ask the hard questions first, we're not going to play very long. If the first question we ask is we want a no-spy agreement, and we want every country in the, United States, in, in the world, starting with the United States, to live up to its obligations under human rights law, we won't get very far. That's what we've been doing for the last 18 months, and it hasn't worked. Not that I'm ready to give up on human rights law or first principles, but I think we need to begin the long game with a strategic intervention that asks the easy questions first. And maybe they aren't even that easy. 
I think we, we can't threaten or punish the United States into compliance with the European idea of civil liberties on the internet. We have to persuade them that it is in their interest to do so. How do we do that? I think we start with a set of questions, and some of them have come up already today. We start with a set of questions that will open the door to dialogue, because there is a common interest in resolving them. Let's talk about the question of extraterritorial access to data. This is the question about, if I am an American company, and you are my customer, and your data is stored on a server in Germany, who can get access to that data? Right now, American law says that any, country, any company with a headquarters in the United States, incorporated into the United States, is subject to US law. And any server, no matter where it's located in the world, is in the technical custody of that company. And therefore, all data located on any of those servers, no matter who it belongs to, no matter where it's located, is required for delivery to an intelligence agency or a law enforcement agency that has a court order. By the way, that same law is basically the same in every democratic country. The difference is market difference. American companies that are headquartered in the United States have about 90% of the data in the world. But if the situation was reversed, it would be German law or French law or British law that was called into question. So we have a common interest in talking about extraterritorial territorial access to data because it is fundamentally about legitimacy. So you ask yourself, in the old days, before the internet, before Google and Facebook and Microsoft, if the FBI wanted the phone records of a German citizen, how would they go about getting that? First, they would have to go to a US court and demonstrate evidence that they needed those phone records, and they would get a document. And that document would then be delivered to the German counterparts, and they would say, we have a treaty with you, a mutual legal assistance treaty, and we have reason to believe that this individual who is your citizen is a criminal or is involved in criminal activity. And 99% of the time, when it comes to German-American relations, that request would be honored. German law enforcement would pass that request to the Deutsche Telekom, and that data would be delivered back through the channel. The moment when the two governments discussed the evidence related to that data request was the moment that policy became legitimate. Because the presumption of the public is, my government will not grant ridiculous requests for access to data from other governments. And as a result, those other governments won't ask. Wasn't that much more complicated than that? But now technology has changed, and when the FBI wants access to the data of a German, they don't need to go to Deutsche Telekom, and as a result, they don't need to go to the German government, they can just go to Google, or Facebook, or Microsoft, or any company that is headquartered in that country, and it is not the fault of those com companies that they are subject to those laws. They are subject to American law in the same way that SAP is subject to German law, in the same way that Alcatel is subject to French law. We have a common interest in solving the legitimacy problem at the base of extraterritorial data access. Second strategic intervention, also mentioned today, industrial espionage. It's one thing that unites the German government and the American government on questions of espionage. Both promise absolutely that they do not engage in industrial espionage. Well, if nobody's engaged in it, then they won't mind prohibiting it, and they won't mind setting up institutional controls and oversight to make sure that it doesn't happen. And although I, that would also create a very nice international opportunity to challenge other countries to get out of the industrial espionage business. Third point in my strategic intervention list, cryptography and certification. The internet is built on a set of standards and certifications for hardware and software. Most of those standards and certifications at the technical level are built by 
quasi-public institutions and private standard-setting bodies dominated by American interests. Not for some conspiratorial reason, but simply because that's where those standards were invented and that's where those companies existed and that's where the network was. Credibility of those standards and certifications is going down. There's an opportunity now for someone else to step forward and say, we have a little bit of technical know-how here and we can build standards and certifications for everybody to live up to and comply with that will give consumers and citizens more confidence in technology. Fourth point, transparency and oversight. We had a whole panel on it this morning, so I won't belabor the point, but parliamentary control should be more than four hours a month. This is a clear and obvious opportunity to change things, to give people more confidence that democratic governments are acting in their interest in response to this problem. These strategies may not sound terribly sexy, certainly not as sexy as no spy, but they might actually work. And I'm worried right now that we're going to get the big zero. If we don't start moving forward on questions that are answerable in the short term and that can force a dialogue and that can begin a process of engagement between countries who have a common interest in reestablishing legitimacy in connection technologies. It's a long game. We're going to be talking about this for the next decade or more. We haven't made much progress so far. It's time to change that. Thank you very much.